you guys. Yeah, Merry Christmas, by the way. Thank you for joining us on Christmas Day. Uh, with this, uh, we had our, uh, our another Christmas service last night, and then I'm thankful for you that were able to make it out this Christmas morning. So let us pray before we get into our service this morning. Father, uh, we thank you for this time that we can gather together on Christmas, and Lord, we are grateful for the most precious gift that you've given to us, the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, the gift to mankind. We thank you for sending him to not only be a light in the darkness, but also to be the Savior of the world. And Lord, we celebrate, as we celebrate your birth, uh, as Christ's birth this morning, we ask that you just fill our hearts, Lord, by your Spirit, you'd fill our hearts with joy, and Lord, you'd fill our hearts with hope, and you'd fill our hearts with love and peace as we remember the gift of your Son. And Lord, I pray that this Christmas service, Lord, would be just a time of celebration as we lift up your son's name and as we give thanks and we praise his name for what he's accomplished on our behalf through the cross, through the resurrection, and through the free gift of salvation that he's offered to, to the world. And so, Father, I pray that this time as we read and as we sing and as we look into your word, may your son be lifted up and may he be glorified. And, Lord, our hearts would leave here with fullness of joy. And it would be all done for your glory. We pray in Christ's name. Would you turn your attention to Luke chapter 2 as we read uh, the Christmas story, uh, the birth of Christ. Would you read it with me? And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quinius was in Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now they were in this same country, shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch of their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe in swaddling cloths. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill to men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all things uh, they had. Amen. Let us, at this time, you can be seated. At this time, we're going to have uh, a, a moment of a symbolic nature of a candle lighting service. And I think it's important to, as we uh, look at this, whether it's on Christmas Eve or on Christmas Day, it's a special time we get to celebrate Christ's birth on Christmas Day. And so that's why I, I think it's important that we continue this, not just on a Christmas Eve service, but also on a Christmas Day. 
Because when Christ came into the world 2,000 years ago, the birth of Christ signified the light that has come into a world of darkness. See, when Adam first sinned, um, the God brought upon a curse upon the earth. And upon that curse being brought upon this earth, men walked in darkness, meaning basically they did what was right in their own eyes. So and as we do what's right in our own eyes, that's really an attack on the absolute truth which God has given to us. But Christ is that light that has shone in the darkness. And up until the time of his birth, there had been a silence. No prophet had spoke. There had been a silence, a sense of darkness, and especially the, uh, the local, this, the geographical area, Israel. They were in darkness, and they had been under the impression of Rome. Uh, they had a, a Jewish leader king and King Herod that was oppressive to them, and they were looking and hoping and praying for this Messiah that would come, that would deliver them from this darkness of oppression. But yet we live in a world today the, the, the darkness still is among us. The, the curse of this world is still real and relevant, but this candlelighting service is to signify that Christ is still the light of the world, that he is the light in the darkness. So today we have the opportunity to remember and to celebrate the hope and the joy that it brings to celebrate that Christ is the light. So may these candles that we light remind us of the light that which is Christ. And may it be a symbol of the hope and the love that we have find in him. As we light these candles, I want our hearts to really say this, what the angels said to the shepherds at this time, what did they say? Fear not. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news. Good news of great joy that will be for all people. What is this good news? For unto you, you and me, for unto you is born this day a Savior. Someone to save us from the darkness. Who is it? It is Christ the Lord. So as we light these, this is a signifying, this is a, this is a picture. This is a picture of light that has come to the darkness. This is a picture of light that has come from a loving Father down to heaven as, as God became man for us to give us hope, to give us light. And as this light came, as we look into the birth of, of Christ, you see the life of Christ, the life of Christ, the life of Christ was... Um, signified it was more than just him being born and him being a baby and him being a manger even into his childhood this peculiar child this unique child even confounded the wisest teachers of israel we're not going to light them quite yet guys <laughs> it's part of my illustration sorry <laughs> you can keep them i don't know if they'll burn that long um so as we light these i want this to be a picture I want this to be a picture of the Christ that has come, the babe that has come. He lived a sinless, perfect life. And so the light has come, okay? And we see this light. We celebrate this light as the birth of Christ. But as this light has come down and he lived this life, the, the evil one, Satan, as thought this light had been extinguished when it went to a cross, right? We thought, the, he, the world thought that the Christ that claimed to be this Messiah was defeated, that death, hell, and the grave had conquered him, that he was a mere man, that he died on the cross. But what did we realize? That three days later, the light arose that conquered death, hell, and the grave and conquered our sin on our behalf. And that light that lives, it's an eternal light that lives evermore. And so this is a signification of light that has come and a light that can never be put out, but a light that has also come for each and every one of us. So uh, Carrie's going to just probably play through something, and I'm going to bring this light, and I'm going to bring it to probably Mark, and then I'm going to have you bring it to each other, and then we'll sing. Uh, we're going to sing two songs as, these, as, we, uh, as we hold these lights. But be careful. These are real, and it has real wax. Okay, and so it might drip on you. So be careful. If you have kids, uh, be careful with that. They can have one. There's candles out there if you haven't. So we're gonna we're gonna sing two songs. We're gonna sing "Hark the Herald Angels Sing" and "O Little Town of Bethlehem." Both of these songs signify the light that is Christ. So we're gonna light these candles and then for today. <laughs> huh? <laughs> we're gonna look at a topic this Christmas morning on. On Jesus, and he's the light of the world. We've seen the progression of our Christmas service today. You've seen the progression of Christ's birth and his, him being the light and the proclamation of Christ. And uh, over the last couple of weeks, we, we've seen these, but we're going to really look at today that Jesus is the light of the world or the light and the darkness. 
We just recently bought a small little farm outside of Fenton, and um, so we, we have a lot of animal chores. I don't know if any of you have grown up on a farm. How many of you have grown up on a farm or doing animal chores? A couple of you. Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. So my boys are growing to love chores, okay? One of the chores that is in our house is to take care of our chickens, right? We have a chicken coop, and that chicken coop is on the back of our property, and it's against the woods, and it's kind of like an open field behind it. And I was telling one of my boys, being pastor kids, I don't, I'm not going to name them. I'm just going to say one of my boys that was out doing the chicken chores. Um, I said, well, buddy, it's going to get dark. You might want to take a light with you. What did he say to me? What do typical boys say? No, Dad, I'll be fine. All right, but don't come crying when it, and I know how long this gets. So sure enough, he wasn't in, and I looked outside, and you know what it was? It was dark and pitch black, and so I had a little boy, and I, I hadn't seen him in a while, and so I, I kind of went out there, and I could, I could, I, is that bad of me just to torture my kids? <laughs> so I look, I was kind of proving a point. Okay, Dad, we don't need to lay him. I'm tough. He was out the back of the barn. He had done his chores, and it was dark. And I could just see fear coming over him, right? Because what do we fear of the dark? I don't care how old you are. I don't care how tough you think you are. If you're in your basement and you turn off the lights behind you, you go a little faster up them stairs. <laughs> Every one of us do. Why? Because we just don't know what's behind us. I still, to this day, do the same exact thing. Why? Because it's the fear of what? The unknown. Or fear of, you know, and, and darkness. You can't see in front of you, right? And so you're always looking for a, a way out. So as Jesus is the picture of the light to the world and, and light that has come in darkness, because darkness is really a great picture of our world, is it not? What is in darkness? There's a fear of the unknown, right? There's a fear of, uh, you know, the, 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 what, it lo what lies beyond death. You know, and I, I know you come here on Christmas, you want to be encouraged. I'm going to say one really discouraging thing real quick. We'll just get it over with. You're going to die. Is that, is that, is that, are, we, are we all clear on that? But the question, so that's the most discouraging thing I'm going to say to you all day, okay? So uh, we got it over with. You swallowed the pill. All right. You're going to die, some of you sooner or later. But the reality of this is what happens after that, right? And so we, we, we have a world that's full of people that live for the now, but they very rarely think of the reality of what is to come, right? So we live in a world that's full of the unknown but secondly, what, what do we figure? We, we're, we're fearful and we're, we're confused as the dark. So I, I, I see my son, and it's, it's, a, it's a picture. He, he's looking, and he knows which way he has to run because in between the barn and my house, there's this big, scary gap between my house. And so I see him back there, and he wasn't going to move, and he's looking around, and he's full of confusion. He didn't know what to do because he's terrified of the dark. And uh, so you know what I did? As a loving father... After I let him be tortured for a little bit, God's much more kinder than us. I went and got the flashlight that I told him to take. You know what I did? I stood at the corner of the house. You know what I did? And I just shined it. What did that signify to my son? It, it, think about it. it it's it's, it's a, a light that shines in the darkness, and it tells us the path to come home. But it not only does it tell us the path to come home, but it tells us that the path to come home is safe. You know what my son did? The moment that I shined the light to him, do you know what he did? And the, if I give this away, it's one of my kids that doesn't run very much. You know, I, I'm raising a bunch of marathon runners. I'm a marathon runner myself. For you, no, I'm not. I, I know my looks can be deceiving, but um, he ran. What did he run to? The light. And what made the difference? Did it take away anything that might have been creeping and crawling in the, world, in the woods behind him? Did it take away? But what it did is it illuminated the path, and it came home. And what did my son know? All he knew is that he had a loving father that was shining a light and telling him it was okay to come home. Do you know what that is to us? Jesus is that light that has been shown into the world, that God the Father is a loving Father that is shining a light to the world. And he's telling us, it is okay to come home. 
It is safe. There is light. There is a path. And you can come down that path. It doesn't matter how far you've gone in sin. It doesn't matter how much pride you have in your life. It doesn't matter your, your past guilt, your past shame, or anything, the, the burdens you carry. All the, the, the simplicity of the gospel is not, uh, it's not, it's not how bad you are. It's, it, it's the simplicity of the gospel is that God has sent his son into the world to rescue you to save you from the darkness, to save you from the curse. And he has offered that light in Christ Jesus. So John 8, Jesus claims this. He said in John 8, 12 is where we're going to look. Jesus states this, that he is the light of the world. This means that he is the source. Jesus said this in John 14, didn't he? He says, I am the, the way. You know what a light also is? Light means truth and darkness is there any such thing as knowing for sure in the world that we live in it's full of darkness what does that mean men do what's right in their own eyes god signifies that when he said that when jesus said this i'm the way the truth and the life he is signifying i am the way in the darkness i am the truth in a world of confusion is he not And I am the way back to the Father. Jesus is the light to the world. He is the source of all goodness and righteousness and holiness. He is perfection embodied for us. You and I cannot be good enough to earn God's favor. Do you know that? That's why he sent Jesus, because Jesus was perfect on our behalf. You and I don't have to be good enough. We don't have to earn good, uh, you know, like heaven. We don't have to earn heaven for being good on earth. No, Jesus was the only one who's good. So when we receive him, we gain all of that goodness and perfection in Christ. Jesus is the one who illuminates the path to come home to the loving arms of our Father. Jesus also claims in John 1, this is really the truth portion. Not only is he the way to the Father, is the light that illuminates the path back to the Father, but he also says this, that in John 1, it says that the light has shined in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. This verse speaks to the fact that Jesus is the light that has overcome the darkness of our sin. See, there's a, there, over all of us, there is this, 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 this shadow of great doubt and fear, okay? And this, I, I promise you, I won't say, this is my second discouraging thing. <laughs> it was appointed unto man once to die. And you know what the Bible says? That each and every one of us, you and me, are going to stand before God and give an account for the deeds done in our body, whether it's our thoughts, whether it's our words, or whether it's our actions. I cannot stand there with you. No, your parents can't be there with you. Each and every one of us as individuals will stand before singular, it will stand before in judgment, will face God at the judgment, okay? Whether that's as for believers or whether it's for unbelievers, the two separate judgments, but we will give an account. But let me tell you something, there, that Jesus is that, the, that light that has overcome the dark shadow of our sin, That dark shadow that looms over you, that the fear of death and the fear of the unknown and the fear of maybe standing before God in judgment, that can all be, those clouds of darkness can be dissipated with the light of Christ. Do you know that? That the darkness of our sin, our hopelessness and sin can be dispelled. It can, it can be, it can dissipate that you can be and know the complete and total forgiveness of our sin, of your sin. Jesus is that light that guides us to the bright path in a world full of confusion and darkness. As, I, as I, I remember my boy, I remember that look on his face. He had no idea what to do. You know, we live in a world that has ultimately rejected the authority of, of God himself, right? And so we have, and basically what we have done is we have disregarded the, the singular authority in this world. If we don't believe in God, that means that there's no God. That means that you, who becomes the authority if God's not existent or if God's not real? Who becomes the authority in our lives? Yeah, let me tell you something that's really encouraging. I'm very discouraging, yeah, man. Without God and without Christ, do you know who your Savior is? you know who, who you find hope in? Yourself. Guess what? If there's no Savior, if there's, there's no God and there's no life, listen, this world that we live in is the only, is the, is the only heaven that you will ever in, be a part of. This is the best that it ever gets. The, it, 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 and, but listen to me. And so what happens is when there's no absolute authority, you and I become authorities. And this is what happens in a world full of darkness and confusion. What does man do? They do what is right in their own sight, don't they? 
We just do whatever we feel like doing. We do whatever we want to do, and there's no one that's going to tell us any different, my friends, and that leads to hopelessness and despair and anxiety and depression, and you'll try to search out for saviors, remember, it may, even if it's in relationships, even if it's in drugs, even if it's in alcohol, even if it's in, you know, uh, all these types of things, money and 401ks. We try to find all these little saviors that are going to bring us hope, but what do we realize quickly? They don't last. I, I've met people in my, in my path as a pastor that have had all the money in the world. You know what? When they face a deathbed, do you know what? The one thing that they, the way they wish they had the most? Hope. I've seen people live lives, reject the authority of God in their lives, and pursue relationships with men and with women, and they hope they find the right partner, and they hope they find this person that's going to satisfy them, and you know, they go from person to person to person, and you know what they realize? They're never satisfied. I've seen people, you know, that it's parties, it's drugs, it's, I, I've lived that life, I know that life, looking for some sort of hope and peace, and you know what you only find? Further darkness, despair. Listen to me. In a world that offers you many saviors, they're not saviors at all. There's one true Savior that can deliver you from the darkness of your sin, and that is Christ the Lord. He, not, he will take, he, because He is that everlasting light, He is that eternal light, He can take each and every one of us out of the darkness of our sins, and He can put us onto the light which is Christ and give us hope, peace, and joy for the first time in our life. And you cannot take that away because it comes from God. It doesn't come from any of these temporary saviors that this world offers you. Jesus is the light that saves us from our hopelessness. But in John 5, he says this, Jesus is the light that gives us eternal life. I'm going to make up for all my discouraging comments. John 5, he says this, Jesus says that whoever hears his word and believes in him has eternal life. Listen to me. Why is Christmas, why, you ever seen those ladies, I'm going to pick on you, you ever seen how women decorate all the time, men? Love, joy, hope, at Christmas, anyone else have those decorations all over the house? No, I'm the only one, okay. Not willing to admit it, husbands, you're smart. My wife's watching, wife, uh, Susanna, please forgive me. <laughs> but we see the season of love, joy, hope, right? Do you know where that, that whole aspect of Christmas comes from? Where, where is love found? comes from God. Where is hope found? It comes from God. Where does, did I say joy already? Where does joy come from? It comes from God. Listen to me. This love, hope, joy that we see at this Christmas time really only comes when you have the eternal love of God placed in your heart through the salvation that is found in Jesus Christ. Hope is only found not in the things that you can get in this world and the ways you can live in this world and see every country and make all the money in all the world and do all the things you want to do. That's not hope. Hope is knowing that when you face the reality of death, that you have a hope that is secured in Christ Jesus and your hope is fixed in him because he promised that if you believed in him, if you received him as your savior, he would gift you eternal life. And you know what that means? That he has forgiven all of your sins past, present, and future. If you are in Christ, if you have received Christ as your Savior, let me tell you something really encouraging. You stand before God in complete and total perfection. It's called the, it's, it's called the righteousness of Christ. When we receive Jesus, that all the perfection that was in Christ becomes ours. So if we stand before God on judgment as a believer, he's not going to see all of our sin. He is going to see Christ and all of Christ's goodness and all of Christ's perfection. The righteousness of Christ is the gift of God that we receive, that we become perfect before God. You become blameless. So if you are in Christ today... You have this greatest hope that you stand before him completely and totally forgiven. Judgment has been passed. It was passed on his only son, on your behalf. The wrath of God through Christ has been appeased. You can be set free. Jesus is the source of eternal life. And by believing or receiving him, it's not just by doing a ritual of a prayer, but it's literally by faith, 
trusting all that you have, all that you are, nothing in your good works, trusting Christ as alone, simply as you sat in that seat. It's believing wholly on him. He gives you the gift. we close our service after after communion but as you've seen through this 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 service i want you to see as we've progressed through this we've seen the, we've seen the, really the christmas story through both both readings and and through songs and through prayers and through uh, reading of the scriptures but I, I i want you to see as we celebrate the birth of christ we realize one thing you can be seated we're gonna i'm sorry i should have told you that earlier as we've seen, as Christ came and he was born unto us, as he was born unto us as a Savior, that Savior that was come, he was a, a lamb that was prepared for us. And he was prepared before us as a lamb that was coming to give up his life on a cross. That's ultimately what Jesus did, wasn't it? That he, he was born to die. Who did he come to die for? Yeah. Because our sin demanded a sacrifice, right? And we couldn't, we couldn't do it. We couldn't save ourselves. We couldn't, we couldn't produce salvation. We couldn't become good enough. It was impossible for us to save ourselves. So God sent a Savior in His own Son, and He was born, but He was also a Lamb that was born, and He came to die. And, and He was born as He lived a sinless, perfect life. He came to a cross. And what did He do when He came to the cross? He offered up His body, Right? And you look at the cross and you see and you hear stories and you, you see it in Scripture of how his body was beaten and maimed on our behalf beyond recognition even as a man. You, you've seen the mocking and the shame and the, the crowds jeering at him and, and, and placing a crown of thorns upon his head and a robe on his back saying, Hail, King of the Jews. You, we see the mockery that he endured on our behalf. And as he carried that cross, as he, as he carried it through the streets and people spit on his face and pulled out of his beard, and he, he, he offered his physical body for us. But there's so much more than that. Because the requirement that God laid out in the Old Testament became fully realized in, in the cross is that there was a lamb that would need to come that was perfect without spot and blemish. And ultimately that sacrifice that they had pictures of in the Old Testament came into full realization with Christ as he was the perfect spotless lamb of God. As he went to offer his life upon a cross, he offered not only his body, but he offered his blood as an atonement for all of our sins. And my friends, when he offered himself, he, sa he said to Telestai, he said, my father, it is finished. The work of the atonement, it is finished. And he gave up his body and he gave up his blood. He shed his blood on the cross and payment for our sins. And this is why the resurrection is so important because as he made that sacrifice, three days later, he rose from the grave. And do you know what that signifies? That God the Father had accepted the payment of the Son that it was fully satisfied. The wrath of God against your sin, the judgment of God against your sin can be appeased and you can have life and eternal life and the total forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ. And he commands us to remember that. That is what all of the Bible is about. Do you know, the Bible is not like uh, teaching good people to be religious and obeying a bunch of religious laws and doing these ceremonies that we don't even know. Or you know, it, It's not about that. All of Scripture, all of it, points to how God has redeemed His people from the darkness of their sin. Whether it's types and pictures in the Old Testament or pointing to Jesus and the cross in the New Testament, it all points to one thing, how God has redeemed His people. So we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper because ultimately the, the Savior that was born today, whether he was really born today or not, that we can argue about that another time. As we signify the birth of Christ today, let us not just celebrate his birth, but let us also remember his death and the sacrifice that he gave for us. In 1 Corinthians, it tells us that the, the, the blood of, that we remember that he was a sacrifice for us and that he is with us and that he cares for us and intimately and ultimately he is going to return again for us. Do you believe that? He asked us all, every time that we would gather 
that we'd partake in the Lord's Supper to remember his sacrifice, a, a babe that was come to, be, to come to die, that we would remember that he has given up his life, given up his body, and shed his blood on our behalf, that we will, and ultimately that we remember that we have this eternal hope that one day we will partake of the Lord's Supper together with him in heaven. It gives us great hope for what's to come. But before we do that, I would ask you just, I'm going to pray. I would ask you just to quiet your hearts. This is a time, and I don't want you to think of it as a time of, of great guilt and great shame. I, 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 but I want you to think of it as that story that I used in, as a loving father that, who has sent light into the world to redeem us out of darkness. I want you to think of it as a father that desires to have fellowship with a son or with a daughter. And the thing that separates us from that loving Father is our sin. Communion is a time to examine our relationship with God, our walk with God, and, and not to just beat ourselves up, but to realize that there's a loving Father that continually offers us grace and mercy every single morning, every single day. He, the, the, the grace and the mercy that God offers us is eternal. It's endless. So I'm going to pray, and then I, I would just ask you to bow your hearts before God and examine your relationship with God before we partake of the elements. So let's pray. Father, we are so thankful that light has come, that you sent light into this dark world. We thank you for the salvation that you've gifted to us. We are thankful for the promise that there, are, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So Father, as we quiet our hearts before you, Father, I pray that we would ex examine our walk with you. Lord, that if there's sin between us, if there's darkness, if there's a walking in darkness, Father, that we would turn again to the light that which is eternal in Christ. And that we would run home. That we'd come back to the arms of a loving Father who is continually shining the light of Christ into this world. Father, no matter how far our hearts have distanced from you, no matter if it's in the dead coldness of religion or in the, uh, in the far country of sin, Father, that we would see the light of Christ and we would come home, that our hearts would run home and we would run into the arms of a loving Father, a Father who calls us, a Father who draws us, a Father who saves us, a Father who offers us life, and freedom. Father, thank you for saving us. Thank you for sending your son for us. Father, as we partake of the elements, let us do it with joy. Let us do it with hearts of gratitude and thankfulness that you didn't just leave us here to walk in darkness, but you sent light to save us. So, Father, draw us to yourselves. Let our hearts be full as we partake, as we remember what you've accomplished for us, what you've done for us. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. As, I, as, I, as we partake of the Lord's Supper, I usually, can I have someone, would someone be able to help me? I'm going to let you stay seated in your seats. Usually I have our congregation come forward but I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass the elements, okay? So Mark, would you, Don, you want to help me? These elements, they, they represent the body and they represent the blood that was shed for us. There is no means of salvation in these. The, this is just a symbolic nature of what Christ has accomplished for us, Mark, would you? We're going to pass, I'll, I'll let you go on the left and Don can go on the right. These are just a picture and a symbol of what Christ has accomplished for us.
in 1 Corinthians, we're commanded as believers to take part of these symbols and do it as a remembrance of what Christ has done for us. There's no greater time to remember what Christ has done for us than on Christmas, do you agree? Because ultimately it's the, the birth of Christ is the beginning of the light, but it's also the remembering of why he came. So we're commanded by the Lord to remember these things and to give thanks and do it with a joyful heart. It says for, in 1 Corinthians 11, it says, For I received from the Lord will also deliver to you that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which is for you. It's the gift, which is for you. Partake, or do this in remembrance of me. Let us partake. And in the same manner, he took the cup and says, in this cup is the new covenant in my blood. He pictures this, the offering that Christ gave of his blood for the complete and total forgiveness of our sins. He says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do, those, do this as often as you drink it, for in remembrance of me. Let us drink. that passage ends like this. As for, as for as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This whole service has portrayed the birth of Christ and Christ as being the light of the world and how he has come and it's great joy to us, but it's also brought us all the way through to the cross and what he's accomplished for us. So this is a picture of of what he has done for us, but also gives us hope for the future that is to come. That ultimately, he's going to recreate a new heavens and a new earth. All sin will be gone. There'll be no more tears. There'll be no more sickness. There'll be no more death. And we'll be with Christ eternally. As you leave this Christmas morning, I want to just leave you with a, a benediction. Let me read. It says, May the peace of Christ, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds on Christ. May the love of God, which has been poured out into our lives through His Spirit, fill you with joy and hope. And may the light of Christ, which has shone into the world, guide you through the darkness and into His marvelous light. May you experience the fullness of God's grace and his love, not only this Christmas, but into, into the new year and throughout the coming year. Amen? Amen. You guys are dismissed. Thanks for being with us this Christmas morning.